Yes. Thank you, Your Holiness. Welcome back. We had an amazing morning. I think we all agree. It might have been a whole graduate course in the chemistry of the brain and neuroscience. I have to confess that there were points at which I felt that my head was hurting as I was taking in all of this amazing information. But I could also hear and sense in the room, throughout the room, these moments of Aha, that's how it works. I think we all really are just so deeply grateful to you, Nora, for that wonderful, wonderful presentation. And your holiness to you, too. Yes? May I add one thing? You certainly may, always. <laughs> I think from, from childhood, I always see look from because of negative side, negative side away. If someone, if you tell something, then I always look. From the contrary side. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. That also, we train that way. So, so one way, I really appreciate all the specialists. Really, you are expert. Uh, but your own field is really expert. I really very much appreciate. But these things are, from the Buddhist viewpoint, relative. It connected mm -hmm. many other things. So, in order to become a really realistic specialist, you should look wide away. Uh, uh. <laughs> Sometimes, like, like this, you see, great scientist, look only. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's the exception. He's the exception. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's the exception. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Your Holiness, thank you, because that's the perfect introduction <laughs> to the afternoon, because we hope to widen the lens oh. and, and look more widely at some of these questions. The other thing, though, that I wanted to comment on this morning, I thanked our presenter, but I also want to thank you, because watching you take in this information, this flood of information, and then with your questions, always anticipating the next slide, the next mm -hmm. step in the logical sequence that the scientist is pursuing in her research is just extraordinary. And also the intellectual stamina that Your Holiness brings to these interactions is a wonderful demonstration of the value of getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning and meditating every day. <laughs> so we learn from watching Your Holiness. Thank you. So it's wonderful to have Nora Volkow and her powerful voice as another of the neuroscientists on this impressive neuroscience team we've been hearing from all week. Uh, and then also as our only physician, and I did want to mention that among our presenters, uh, Nora is our only physician, and she's committed to this hopeful view. I'm just I'm not a psychiatrist. Oh. Right. Committed to this hopeful view that, as she often says, and I think said on her first slide, Drug, ab drug addiction is a chronic brain disease that can be treated, and every word in that sentence carries freight for her, because it's a declaration of progress. It's uh, the triumph of modern science over myths and misconceptions that have, uh, uh, that have been with us for many, many years, that painted addicts as lacking in willpower, as morally um, failed with flaws as people who should be treated as deviants, should be separated from society, should be punished criminally. Now those stereotypes that she is working against in her post in Washington uh, do persist. They have not gone away. Um, and those stereotypes are produced through social processes. Uh, they create them, they sustain them. So part of what we want to do this afternoon is to begin to explore some of those larger social processes. But first I wanted to just say that I think we've noted a number of fascinating parallels in these past two and a half days between the emerging scientific understanding of craving, desire, and addiction and the Buddhist scholarship, or as Your Holiness said, as you were lightly correcting your uh, jimpa, thumpton jimpala, uh, with a great smile, not just Buddhist, but ancient Indian philosophy and psychology. 
um, we've seen really interesting parallels. And I think there's something both very reassuring in those parallels and also something humbling in them. Reassuring to know that a wisdom tradition extending back some 2,000 years of systematic first-person study of the human mind has reached conclusions that support the findings that are now coming out of the very different and relatively very new third-person investigations of modern science. That's reassuring. Humbling to be reminded that our whiz-bang technology is in part simply confirming things that were already known. But of course, that's only part of the story because they are also pointing us in new directions. And it's the combination that's powerful of the two perspectives. And almost as Keith was explaining to us yesterday, it takes the combination of the activated brain, activated by dopamine, and the cue to create the result. And I think the combination of these two traditions, when they come together, can create a powerful result in a similar way. And I was re reminded this morning, as I was thinking about that, of the words from T.S. Eliot uh, about exploration, where he wrote, we shall not cease from explorations, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. So I think, in part, we're seeing a process <laughs> like that. <laughs> Also, I was struck during our conversations yesterday afternoon that another of the deep resonances, deep concordances between these two great intellectual traditions, both of which in many ways are pursuing how do we know reality? How do we find reality and know it when we see it? A similarity is that they pursue that question, both of these traditions, in the context of a community, a very powerful, strong, intentional community, a community, community that's rooted in very deep values. And for science, it's the community of peer review and of the requirement that results have to be reproducible. We, yesterday, Kent's charming, I think, and just disarming humility. He kept saying, I may be wrong, and we heard the same words from Nora this morning. Those statements are not only because these are wonderful and deeply honest people with great integrity, they're also expressions of a deep value of Western science. The dictum from Albert Einstein that no experiment can ever prove me right, and a single experiment can always prove me wrong. Your Holiness's playful and affectionate comments putting Jimpa on notice that the monks were poised to pounce when he started his presentation and then pointing out that he had a mistake on one of his slides. <laughs> he had misspelled a word. Was also an demonstrating an essential value of a community, a sangha, committed to rationality, to empiricism, to skepticism, to pragmatism. So, and you too often express your willingness to be persuaded if someone can bring you evidence that might prove you wrong. So we have that combination of communities that see the world in that same way in, that I've described. And we are deeply embedded here in these two powerful communities. And communities are social and cultural constructions. They're the work of societies. A so, uh, an American sociologist, Robert Bella, wrote a book once called The Good Society. And the opening sentence of that book was, it's difficult to be a good person in the absence of a good community and a good society. And I think we all mm -hmm. agree that that is true. So yesterday, also, Your Holiness, when you were offering Ken a perspective on his puzzle, he called it a puzzle about how fear and desire could possibly be linked in the same brain system, you said, we're all social animals, and when we become isolated or feel alone, that creates fear. And I think all of us in the room recognize the truth in that comment. You and Nora made similar comments to each other this morning. So we turn now, this afternoon, to these social and cultural considerations. And to guide us, we have 
wonderful anthropologist, Vibeka Asmussen Frank. She's an anthropologist, as I say, who directs a center for alcohol and drug research at Aarhus University in Denmark. She's been there for mm. 12 years. Her own work has been mainly studying marijuana, uh, cannabis, as it's called, but also alcohol and alcohol abuse and other drugs. She studied policies and treatments in community settings and in prisons, with a special focus always. She's always interested in understanding the perspectives of the people who are using the drugs. What is it meaning to them? What are their lives like? Over many years, it's been the case that Scandinavian scholars, scholars from the Nordic countries, have made major contributions to alcohol and drug research. They're well known for that. And also to approaches using qualitative methods to try to understand, dig down underneath the underlying meanings of social phenomena. And that's the tradition from which Vibeka comes to us today. So she will be raising questions She'll be challenging assumptions, and she'll be hoping, hoping that by doing this, she'll, and by opening these additional layers of complexity, as if the problem isn't complex enough already, that that will spark reflection and discussion uh, among the group at another level. In her work, she's most interested in asking, what can we learn when we turn our minds in new directions, and ask, and try to see new perspectives, new questions that we may not have thought about before. So with that, Vibeka, turn Thank it you. over to you. Thank you, Diana. Yeah. Um, it's, it is working, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <coughs> first of all, I would like to express my um, gratitude. It's a deep honor and a privilege to be here today and to share uh, some of my thoughts uh, with your holi holiness. Um, and as Diana said, uh, my main interest is in uh, how, are, how are individuals, how are people living uh, with substances. And substances has been around the world for many thousands of years, since the beginning of mankind. And, uh, and substances can be used in very many different ways. It can be, we can consume them. We can use them in, um, in pleasurable uh, settings for parties and feasts and things like that. And they can become very problematic, as we have heard about uh, the last uh, few days. Um, and um, so some of my interest is also to, to looking at when and how and with whom are these substances uh, used. Um, and a very important point of departure for most of what I'm doing is that using drugs, whether it's legal or illegal drugs, is always social practices. You do it with other people. At least you start out doing it with other people, and it's, it's in certain contexts that drugs are used. Um, so I would like to go to the slides and, and, um, and start out uh, saying that, um, sort of trying to, to, to put my perspective in what we have been learning the past uh, few days and also this morning, that, um, that all the valuable knowledge that we get from studying the brain and, uh, and from your neuroscience science perspectives, um, I sort of move this brain into a person, but <laughs> and and we have also heard um, pers personal or the perspectives seen from the individual from Jin Pala. Yeah, yeah, also. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's good because immediately you know it's a human brain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not mice. Not mice. <laughs> or mosquitoes. Yeah. And not only that, I would like to place individuals in relation to other individuals uh, and, and to show that individuals are always placed in, in, in context and in social relations and that these contexts 
are also larger commun communities and uh, societies as such. And, and that, that these social relations and the whole society affects and shape also the way we uh, look at uh, addiction or, or problematic drug use. So the overall perspective uh, that uh, I will uh, take today is to look at uh, relations between individuals, uh, but also the dynamics between individuals uh, and the sociocultural context. Um, I will look at processes in and out of substance use, problematic substance use or addiction, uh, and, but I will always do this from the perspective of that it's relations between individuals that are uh, important here in this perspective. Um, and then uh, I will take the perspective, as Diana pointed out, of, uh, of the drug user or the substance user. How is it experienced uh, by individuals to use uh, uh, substances? The substance would cover alcohol, drugs, and yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have put in a slide because I wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of science uh, that I'm doing, which is a bit different from what we have heard uh, the past two days, three days. Um, and I would like to start out saying that this presentation is not only based on qualitative research, as I will um, present in more depth to your holiness in a minute, uh, but also on qualitative research using statistics. Quantitative. Yeah. Sorry, quantitative research using statistics and uh, survey results. Um, but my own main field, trained as an anthropologist, is within uh, qualitative research. And the way this kind of science operate is uh, through different methods. And some of them can, for example, be qualitative interviews, where you, um, the researcher engage with another person and ask questions and, and, and gather data in that way, using focus group interviews, where several people are engaged uh, and the researcher uh, go into conversation with these uh, several individuals. It can be part participant observation, where the researcher uh, become becomes part of a certain setting or a certain context for a certain amount of time and sort of try to live with uh, the people who are in this context. And, um, <laughs> and this, this particular uh, method is important in order to, sort, to try to gain um, information that is not... Uh, conscious or spoken about, outspoken, but more tacit knowledge around why is it that we are doing uh, and how is it, or why is it, and, and the ways that we are doing things. So, and then there's texts and documents also. Um, I would also like to say that, that this kind of research is, is not linear, it's more circular. So if you have an interview a guide, for example, for the qualitative interviews, um, and you have interviewed three or four or five people, and you, um, you, you realize that one of the most important things that you would like to know something about, you did not put in your interview schedule. You immediately put it in, and the next, people you in, the next person you interview you ask those questions also. So it differs, for example, from survey research where you have the questionnaire. You would never change that because then you sort of spoil the whole, the whole uh, study. So, so it's a reflexive, circular process, um, this kind of research. Um, of course, the analysis is made more in the end. <laughs> Yeah. 
Of course, the analysis is done more at the end of a research pro project than in the beginning, but the, the analysis is part of the whole project. And what, what comes out is, uh, or what we look at is meaning. You know, what is it, how is it that people in the context that we want to study perceive things or do things? Uh, so, so it comes out in words, not in numbers. Um, we are also looking for patterns and complexity uh, rather than causality. So it's so if there's like two um, different perceptions of things, we don't see that as a problem. We integrate it into the analysis, and we look for processes and dilemmas rather than facts. Um, and we are very aware of the context and the relations that we study. Uh, um, uh, with it th that the study is placed within, and also that that shifting context will also shift the perspectives of the analysis and make different results. So, so this kind of research is not representative, but it can be generalized um, uh, in a in a different way than um, than than studies that are. Um, creating representative data. What do you mean by representative data? Like something that is I mean, like you can say that 10% um, of the population are problematic drug users or... So that's sort of a... That, yeah, that's absolute. Mm. So... Um, in the rest of the presentation, I would like to give two instances to Your Holiness uh, of this perspective, um, a social science perspective. And the first one is um, different ways out of uh, problematic substance use or addiction. Um, and I will look into treatment and treatment efficacy and also into this ph phenomenon called self-change. And the second instance that I would like to bring up is um, to, to point out that regulating substances uh, can also <laughs> cause harm. Usually we regulate substances in, in our societies in order to create well-being and, and secure that citizens are not exposed to harms. But some of the ways that we, re we regulate substances can also cause harm. And I will bring up criminalization of drugs as... Um, the example here. So going back to the first instance. Um, first, I would like to um, go back to what has also been uh, said from other presenters that, that using substances is sort of on a continuum. And how I see it is it's from either not using or consuming uh, substances, to a problematic uh, use pattern. Uh, and if we look at some of the numbers uh, from a European perspective, we see that, um, that one out of four uh, Europeans have tried some kind, one, ki one tried out illegal drugs, and, and marijuana being the most common drugs tried out uh, by Europeans. But if we look at how many uh, problematic uh, drug uses we have in Europe, uh, the numbers differ uh, a great deal. And this is to point out again that, that substances are uh, used very widely and, uh, and they can also be used um, uh, in an unproblematic way. The second slide I would like to show here is that, that um, that many substances peak uh, or are used more uh, in, uh, in a young age. Uh, and, and this is an example with marijuana and it's Danish data, but if we look at European data, they sort of uh, go in the same direction. And the point here is that, that we see that uh, young people in their teens and in their uh, early 20s, they use... Uh, a lot more, but it sort of levels out with age. And 
and these are for men, the numbers are for men and the numbers are for women. And I apologize for not having made the same scales, but it's sort of to illustrate that, that, uh, that drug use uh, levels out. And one of the most important, or, or probably the, the most uh, likely um, uh, reasons for this... So what is the explanation for the kind of more frequent use at the young age and then sort of tapering off? It's, it's uh, the, the most important reason for this is lifestyle, that young people, they engage in social contexts where they use drugs together with other young mm -hmm. people. Uh, and then when you grow older, you finish your education, you start working more seriously at least, uh, you get married, you find a partner, you get children, so your lifestyle changes different, um, very much from, from the more peer group uh, kind of lifestyle that you have in your younger uh, age. And jobless? What about uh, jobless, unemployed? I mean, does it make a difference, the factors? Uh, it makes a difference when we go to problematic drug use. Um, mm -hmm. This is sort of still in the line of, of the, the, the continuum between consumption and, and problematic use. Uh, so, so sort of some of the, 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 co the consumption patterns levels out. Uh, these are just regular ordinary people so yeah 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 drug addicts so this is this, this is, is, is population research. research oh yeah this is this, this is, is from the addicts. general population no they're not addicts not necessary so, no. quite a big number so it's mm. in that case the number is proportion is quite big yeah yeah, mm. a lot of people use drugs, but but not <laughs> in mm. a in a in a regular way necessarily. Yeah. So, what kind of questions? Just out of curiosity, I mean, is the question says, have you ever used this last year or ever in your life? I mean, what kind of yeah? Where this are you is getting the this numbers? is whether you have been using the past year or not. Yeah. The numbers are the numbers are higher if you say in lifetime, and they are lower if you say the past month. And, and Vibhika, would you say it's true that if anything, these numbers underreport the actual use? Or not? Do you think people are honest and willing to <laughs> say I that? I it's know. it's hard to say. Hard to say. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, but I know we have that. I know we have that problem with alcohol. With that, alcohol, th that yes. That it's usually underreported, uh, but it's debated whether it's in the same way around drugs. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. So, so what I will sort of jump into for the rest of the presentation is more what happens when, when, when drug use becomes a problem. And, and one of the ways out of... Um, Has there been any studies done on trying to compare between drug you know, use like this, frequency um, like Denmark, the urban community uh, versus Copenhagen. the rural? Yeah. I think the big population is concentrated yeah. in Copenhagen, and the rest of the land is less, less young, population. So differences? Yeah. I know the Danish data. Young people in Copenhagen, they use more frequently mm -hmm. than young people in urban area, area, uh, no. sorry, rural, no, areas rural areas in Denmark. Yeah. So is it because um, it's not that easy to get? The, sub the substances, or is it because there's less interest in the rural areas? In relation to marijuana, it's the same. It's very easy to get mm -hmm. in in, uh, in in the countryside. In, yeah, also also in the countryside. Um, I think 
it's more related to the different kinds of lifestyle that's, that are also more likely to be in a city, like going out, partying, um, all that. So going back to the more problematic sides of, uh, of, of substance use, so treatment, as we also heard this morning, is uh, uh, a very common way that to, to offer um, to, to drug problematic drug users or addicts as, as, an, uh, as a, a way to try to overcome um, this uh, problem. And, and we could say that uh, what is treatment? It's any kind of structured intervention, uh, either medical or psych psychosocial or combination of both. So, so substitution drugs can be used, but different kinds of, of uh, more behavioral uh, kinds of interventions can also um, uh, be applied. And, and there are many different forms uh, of treatment, like outpatient treatment, where, you, where the patient or the client comes once a week, once every two weeks, or something like that. It can be day treatment, where the patient has to show up every day, or it can be residential treatment, where the patient sort of goes to this treatment home and stay for a, um, um, a longer, sh shorter or longer period of time. Um, and there are many different kinds of, of, um, of, uh, of uh, treatment models. Uh, and I won't go into this here because I know that Sarah will be talking more about this uh, on Friday. But this is just to say that that uh, that 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 we have treatment and and many societies offer treatment as a way out of uh, of problematic substance use. What I would like to show your holiness with this slide is that. Uh, Evaluating the effect of treatment, one common way of doing this is to look at how many um, how many clients or patients are abstinent after a certain still abstinent after a certain amount of time, and um, and we can see here on these slides that that it's up it's measured uh, up to 12 months after dischargement of treatment, and the slide to the left is. Um, is uh, results from the early 1970s, late um, late 60s and 1970s, um, and the the um, the the curve on the right is the recent data um, from different kinds of of, um, of drug treatment, residential drug treatment, residential alcohol treatment, and the treatment uh, form for young people between 14 and 17 years of age. And what I would like to show here is that the curve is sort of the same, that, that it's, um, it's within these 30 or 40 years, we still have around 20 or 25 percent of, of people who are still abstinent after, after, um, after dischargement of treatment. <laughs> Um, so, of course, it puzzles a lot of a lot of 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 us. What what can we do more to sort of raise the efficacy uh, of treatment? And um, and social science. Social science offers um, different kinds of, or certain kinds of insights. So now we are talking about uh, substance abuse. Yeah. 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 Addicts. Yeah. Mm. There's, a, there's a little uh, confusion around, I know that, around the different terms. Uh, in Europe, we tend to use the, the, world, the word problematic drug use. That's the term that the European Monitoring Center for Drug and um, and drug abuse uh, wants to use as the official term. Um, so that's why I sort of, because I'm from that part of the world, use a lot also. But there are, it, it's, it's a, it could also be addiction. But, but um, so there are different. Addictions, like we said, Europe to Europe, addictions, problematic substance use. 
，就开始往水里搞嘞。他肯尿得紧个，啊嘞，那我尿得紧个多呢，再滴个都不行，不行了。嗯。But would you say that they basically correlate? I think that it's sort of it's a way to say to sort of point at this continuum uh, and say that there are the, the the continuum from addiction maybe in the the, the one end or the the, the extreme end. Th there's also so there's also other um, gradations. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing. And another thing is that that um, that there are many different problems that that drug uses or problematic drug uses experience not only the craving and so on, but also the lifestyle that they get into because of uh, addiction. Um, like uh, losing friends, losing mm. family, uh, losing your job, um, uh, living more on the street if you're more of a hardcore drug abuser or, or, or addict. Uh, and those kind of experiences, losing these uh, social relations and, and job uh, opportunities and so on, also affects our problems that, that the, the drug user uh, experience. Um, in Italy, I in the drugs are in the normal situation. I can go to the missile. I'm going to go to the normal situation. So what I would like to um, to uh, to look more into here is uh, if we have another uh, perspective on treatment, and especially also uh, ask more, look into and ask um, the clients uh, who are in treatment. Um, using these kinds of methods that I uh, showed your holiness um, before. Uh, we research shows that substance users goals, goals for it, experiences of treatment can uh, shed some light on how and why treatment succeeds. And I can give you a, an example. Like uh, some studies have shown that, that, that drug users do not go into treatment in order to become abstinent but they go into treatment because they want to control their drug use. That could be one goal. They want a pause from uh, a, dist a distressful life, uh, trying to get all the drugs all the time. Uh, they would like to um, um, well, well, anyway, that's two, that's two uh, examples of, of, uh, of different uh, goals uh, for treatment. The experience uh, of treatment, one example can be that, that some drug users who are in treatment have very many difficulties with the control system that are also in the treatment, uh, especially if you get substitution drugs. Um, and... and that dilemma between actually want to go into treatment but having difficulties uh, applying, or no, not, not applying, but being in that treatment setting because it feels too controlled for them is sort of something that, that we could think more about. Could uh, you, I think it might be good if you explained it a little more fully. Okay. So if they're taking a substitution drug, yeah. then they're monitored. Yeah, right. they monitored. Explain, into explain how that happens yeah. and why it's, it feels intensive. Um, the way this is uh, this can be done is that it's monitored uh, so that that you have to go to the treatment institution, get your substitution drug. Um, the treatment personnel has to look at you, take the drug, uh, because the treatment institutions do not want you to misuse that kind of drug or sell it to someone else. So it's monitored in that way. Uh, it can be very difficult. So what would be a substitution drug in the case of marijuana? Yeah, th there's no there. Not right. for marijuana. Uh, not to my... Uh, it can be for, for opiate addiction. Opiate it, addiction. Could, it could be... So what is the substitution drug? What would be a uh, given example? That could be a methadone, for example, methadone. Okay. or so it, is a, it is a potent drug. It is a potent drug, Richard. yeah. And it depends on opium addiction, you know. That's why I'm going to talk about opium. I'm going to talk about 
And one could say that there are very good reasons for monitoring these drugs because they're very potent. Um, but yeah. Yeah. but it, it can create dilemmas for, for people either being in treatment or going into treatment. And, and also, as you told me, it can deter them from seeking treatment. Yeah. So you, you end up defeating yourself in a way because you want people to go into the treatment system, but there's something about the treatment system that keeps them out of mm. it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, another... Um, mm. Another point I would like to, um, to stress is that, that some, of, some of this kind of research um, point out that the structural conditions uh, that, that drug users live under uh, affect the incentives to either stay in or out of problematic drug use. If you're in treatment, but you can't really see um, a possibility of getting access to uh, the labor market or getting access to educational system or other kinds of social health systems, or if you sort of lost your uh, belonging to social networks, then it, then it becomes um, sort of a balance between do I, is it better for me to stay in, in drug use because there's usually a lot of sociality around social networks, around drug, <coughs> drug use in community also. So there's sort of um, uh, dilemmas here uh, in relation to, um, to, um, uh, to treatment. And, and this sort of leads to the next point that, that substance uses uh, everyday life and the conditions they live under would always affect uh, treatment. And, and some researchers have pointed uh, uh, out that maybe we could also try and shift the focus and not only look at how clients comply with treatment. Like, um, there are many different forms of treatment and many different kinds of, um, of, uh, of, um, of, of drug users who are in need of treatment. But, and one, one drug user might benefit more from one kind of treatment from, than from another kind of treatment. So this is very important to have that perspective, how a treatment, uh, how a client comply with treatment. But maybe we could also turn it the other way around and say that how can treatment uh, actually concord with clients' everyday life so that the, the client in treatment or the patient in treatment do not uh, experience a sort of a, a dilemma or, 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 or a, a, a problem between their everyday life and, and, and the, the, the treatment they they get. Maybe you could give it an example. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, well, this is a very banal exa example, but 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 treatment um, treatment institution also has to be where the the drug users are, or the 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 ones who sort of need I need a, of treatment. Um, if there's a very long way to the treatment institutions, it can be very hard for people to, to, um, to, to, uh, to get to treatment. Another one could be in relation to the control aspect that, that, um, that some people would like to administer their substitution drugs themselves, for example, getting it at a pharmacy instead of getting it at a, at a, at a treatment facility. Um, and Yet another one could be that that some treatment facilities, especially for more hard drug users, uh, they tend to have an illegal drug market outside the treatment facilities because a lot of drug users gather around these facilities. So if you don't want to be exposed to to sort of the illegal drug market when you're also in in treatment, that that sort of that sort of um, uh, Dilemmas and and uh, and um, and conditions um, are important to to look at also when we look at at treatment. 
من در سوسو سریه چیز من اسلام من در شیاسوا. نه نه چقدر اسلام. تا دی؟ اینی کار کارو پیگی انتو تی کار اتیک شش به اینی میتیگی که چی کسی نیه اینی. این دی پولت اینی چقدر یه یه کاری چی سوگی تو اتاق جلوش نچقدر. So you spoke about um, the, the kind of adaptation or tailoring of the treatment mm. according to the specific needs of the individual addicts. Mm. His Holiness's question is, is, this, is it determined on the basis of an in-depth interview or do you also use kind of physiological measures to determine what kind of treatment would work? I think it depends on sort of where you are in the world, how you do that. Um, but but my experience from where I come from is that it's the, it's it's on the basis of a sort of a, a an interview, interview before before and then you then then the the client is asked different kinds of of questions and usually the clients are asked the same kind of questions. But yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So this morning we heard about uh, individual variations with relation to the the presence or abs kind of um, uh, the presence of how many D two receptors there are in the individual, which seems to you know dis dispose them or not dispose them towards uh, kind of drug abuse or substance abuse. So these kind of considerations are not part of the evaluation of what kind of treatment would suit an individual in your case, in your study? No. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's based on clinical. Clinical. Uh, yeah. Rishab. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think... So then how would you know that what is the most optimal treatment that the individual needs? Well, I think we should maybe ask... Uh, Sarah and Nora about that also, but but uh, because they have clinical experience, uh, but but it's ba it's based on it's based on different things. I mean, they're not just even though we would really like to have that a whole range of different kinds of treatment. Usually, societies mm -hmm. have to choose some of some kinds of treatment also based on the population side si size of the population and so on, uh, because it's also I mean, it costs money and so on, and you need, you need, um, you need, you know, you need, you need clients in order to to run the treatment uh, facilities and so on. But but um, but it depends on the drug. What are what are the primary drug problem? Is it opiates, or is it cannabis, or is it alcohol, or what is it? So it it's depending on the the kind of drug that is. Um, but many drug users who come into treatment have are um, multiple. They use m they're different kinds of drugs, not just one drug. Yeah. Okay. So I would like to go to um, um, another uh, way out of problematic substance use. Uh, which is uh, has by by many has been called uh, self change, and by self change we mean individuals who have recovered from an addiction on their own, without going into uh, treatment. And of course, I don't know if it's of course. <laughs> what, can you go back to the previous slide? <laughs> what does those chains symbolize? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Breaking free of addiction. Oh, free. <laughs> yeah. I think it was a picture that we found on the internet as just a symbol of freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> like this one. So yes, the, this reaching for the stars. Uh, yeah. This is better. Oh. Yeah, this is better. <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm I'm glad to have them evaluated. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, there are different kinds of research on self-change, and one is that some have tried to figure out how many self-changes are there, um, and and how um, common is this way out of problematic sub substance use, and and I've s these uh, data are mainly based on population uh, surveys, 
population survey results where um, where a representative number of of um, persons in a society are asked the same questions, and then you can calculate how many percentages are um, have been using uh, drugs or alcohol, and and then you can also ask them, have you had any problems with uh, a substance the past year? And and uh, one of the instruments used uh, to do this is um, is the DSM. Um, uh, uh, instrument where uh, people are asked about different kinds of uh, problems like withdrawal uh, symptoms like we talked about uh, yesterday um, or if you're using more than uh, you um, initially intended to do um, and things like that. So there are different kinds of questions that that people are asked and I've, I've just made one example here of um, of um, of how many self-changes uh, that there are in one population survey from Canada. Uh, and it says that if you have one problem, or this uh, uh, survey um, respondent had said that he or she had one of these DSM um, uh, problems, it's these, this number, 87.5% uh, who have been in remission the past year. Uh, and if it's six problem, Problems. They have reported uh, six problems. It's uh, more than 50% uh, who have been in remission the past year. So it's quite a, a large number of people who have this experience of getting out of problematic um, um, uh, substance use uh, on their own. Um, and of course, these numbers also say that the severity of the problem is very important in relation to whether it's possible to get out of it on your own or not. So I would like to um, uh, look a little bit into, so what are the reasons for, for uh, these people who um, go on to this journey of, of self-change uh, and how do they maintain uh, self-change? What, what are the, what are their, um, what do they report uh, to researchers when they um, when they have this experience? And some of the the, the most important reasons for starting a self change is that they have experienced some kind of positive life circumstances. And as we talked about earlier, it could be like you get a partner, um, you get a child, you. Um, move to another part of the country where you um, uh, sort of fit better into um, uh, into society there than you did uh, where you used to live and so on. So experience of a positive life circumstances. Another one is that uh, social influence from friends and family and partner is very important uh, to start self-change. And then also health concerns. If a person starts to um, experience loss of memory due to drug use or different kinds of illnesses, that can be a cutting point for for a um, person to, to start self-change. And then yet another important uh, reason is that the individual change perception of the substance used from, uh, from a positive to a negative and I think we uh, learned uh, from Mark also on the first day how these perceptions can change about whether it's uh, a pleasure or helpful or joyful to use a drug uh, or, or if it sort of changes into a perception of this is negative for me to, 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 to be in this. And then I should also say, and this is um, that it's hard to single out one thing and say this is it, but these are sort of the... The, the the important reasons uh, um, that that uh, that these survey uh, sorry these uh, research results shows, and whether the individuals report that it's certain or planned decision to get out of problematic substance use, that's both. So on the other hand, how can how can these people maintain? Uh, yeah. So, so how do these people maintain self-change, not getting into problematic use? And I should say that 
that many report that they do not necessarily become abstinent. Some of the, the studies show that the people who become abstinent and want to become abstinent, that's also the people who had most, who were most severely affected by their drug use. Um, but they could also just level it to a more to a consumption level where it doesn't uh, give them problems uh, with their uh, substance use. But but very important so points. So in that case, difficult when you say remission. So you're not talking about you know a use. You're talking about not having that same problem. Yeah. Okay, so the Getting out of not re not <coughs> responding to these uh, criteria of the, the of the DSM, DSM instrument. So it's not a question of use. You c you can you can become yeah. abstinent or you can become yeah, a controlled or okay. cons consumer of drugs. Yeah. So what is reported uh, in maintaining self changes? Right. So it's, is it it's is clear? clear? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was under the impression remission was judged by use. Abs we judged by abstinence. abstinence, abstinence. Yeah. Mm. But you've said from the, day, the slide DSM, you showed yeah. us before, so people either had one problem or they, yeah. had, right? And Three. so the one problem. You d if you're in remission, you do not have any problems. Have you don't problem. have any problems, problem, yeah. right? But you may still be using, using it, yeah. And the, yeah. the alcohol. Yeah. And, and I, would, I would guess that that would typically be these more benign substances, so alcohol and marijuana. Yeah, that because are there are most studies on those right, substances. Right, and for some of these more dangerous drugs that we've been talking about, it's but it may be harder to to kind of settle in at a level of use that doesn't get you into trouble. Is that true? That's true. That's one thing. But another thing is also that some of the the more uh, hard drugs or problematic drugs, they are harder to find in population. It's harder to find people in population studies that have used those. So some researchers, they go to other uh, um, uh, uh, study designs than, than, than population surveys in order to investigate these, uh, these phenomena. And some, but some, there are quite a few uh, that says that, that you know, getting out of problematic drug use from opioids or or, or, or cocaine is also done through self self change, so it's not just, yeah. But if you you would describe a continuum from yeah, <coughs> it's kind of safe, regular, yeah. safe, modest yeah. use to yeah. very yeah. serious problems. Unlikely that these people we're talking about are at the very extreme yeah. end. They're yeah. probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah. True. Well, some of them are. Some there, of them there's are. Some, there's some who are farther yeah, along. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But this is also an area, and I'm bringing it up because I think that this area of self-change can, can sort of, is is an is a window to to getting more knowledge about substance use and problematic substance use and addiction. But it's also an area that is n not as well researched as many other areas of of uh, of uh, of drug drug abuse or, or addiction. So, so in a way, it would be really good if we could do more research in this area in order to gain more insights into what are the kinds of dynamics that are going on here. Uh, because it seems like it's quite a few people who, who actually manage to get out of, of problematic substance use uh, on their own. So, and how, what, what can we learn from this? And also in relation to how can we uh, learn in relation to setting up treatment facilities? What, what is it that sort of are important here? Um, and, and going back to, 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 um, to what is important, reported important uh, to maintain self-change is contact with social networks, family and the labor market. Uh, on the one hand, on the, one, on the other hand, it can be change in social group family and or significant other, because if you're in relationships or networks which are also drug using networks or substance using networks, that might not be very helpful. Uh, social support is uh, reported as an extremely important. 
uh, and whether people are successful the first time or after several attempts, that's both. So relapsing and self-change is also occurring. Um, and I think we heard that from Mark the first day also, the attempts to and the decisions to, to, to try and it's, it's, it can be done for several months and then you sort of relapse and then you go on again. So, so, um, so I think there are, there are um, important insights we can gain from uh, looking more into to this uh, phenomenon on self-change in this uh, area. So, so, so these are kind of suggestive findings. They're, they're no, these are these are based on 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 research, uh, on but research. But not a big body of research. You're saying, the, uh, not not in the same way as we know we have research and treatment. I right, mean, the, okay. the the amount of treatment research is you know just far right. oversized. And you'd like to the, see more work here. It's yeah, I would like to see more work. Spelling all yeah. of that out more yeah. In, yeah. in greater detail. Yeah. Thank you. So. I would like to uh, go from to the second instance that I would like to bring up to your holiness uh, from a, a social science perspective. And, and this is that, that we regulate substances in our societies, but that these kinds of regulations can also cause harm. And I will bring up the criminalization of drugs as, um, as the, uh, the uh, example here. And and the way societies control substances can be in different ways. It's uh, mainly through policies and laws. And it can be public policy where we regulate through taxes or regulate products in different ways. It can be health policies. What kind of treatment do we set up in our societies? What kind of uh, services or, or, um, or, or facilities do we have to reduce uh, the harms of substance use? Uh, it can be prevention policy, as we talked about uh, this morning also. What kind of prevention policy can we implement in order to um, especially um, get our young people to, to, uh, to use less? And then there's control policies that, 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 um, that we pr prohibit some kinds of substances and we punish people who, who either use or possess or, uh, or deal uh, uh, different kinds of substances. And so in this, this is when I sort of move forward to the criminalization of uh, drugs, this is also uh, a differentiation between illegal drugs and illegal drugs and saying that the, 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 the way that we criminalize some kinds of drugs like marijuana, uh, heroin, cocaine, amphetamine, uh, ecstasy and so forth, these kinds of drugs, um, there are good arguments for doing this. Uh, one is that it protects citizens against, against health-damaging substances. And the other is that, this is the, one of the arguments, that punishment deters individuals from using uh, these substances. And whether this works or not, I mean, we see that a lot of people use these substances even though they are uh, prohibited. Um, that's another discussion. But what I would like to um, look into is more like what are the detriments of this drug criminalization and how do criminalization uh, cause harm uh, to individuals? So the first example I would like to present is that because drugs are criminalized, individuals also get uh, arrested uh, from uh, using of possession uh, of drugs, and it can be even uh, small amounts of drugs for own for own use that 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 people get arrested. Um, and we see in many parts of the world, and I have examples here from New York in the U.S., but we also see it in Denmark and in other uh, European countries that the way uh, we the way that criminalization is uh, um, handled in practice, like how do the police approach, or how is this? How 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 do we how do we get these people who possess these drugs that 
that, uh, that, that are criminalized and then get arrested, that there's a social and racial imbalance to the, the way that this is done. Um, and these numbers show that how many um, people are arrested for marijuana possession in New York. And we see that, that black Americans are arrested four or five, five times more often than white Americans uh, down here. On the other hand, we see that white Americans use marijuana more often than black uh, Americans. So, so there is this sort of racial imbalance to it. And the harms to this is that, of course, it's, it's not good for an individual to have a criminal record. I mean, that can sort of set back the opportunities that an individual have uh, in his or her life. That's one thing. And being imprisoned is, of course, also uh, uh, an experience that um, can cause harm to, to, to individuals. Tim <laughs> So this is an, there is an unfair system here. Yes. yes. Unfair yeah. system or that? Unfair yeah, but, implement. But, yes. Yeah. yeah. There is an implementation of yeah. unfairness. Yeah. The way it's implemented is unfair, but it also potentially causes harm to the individual because it's because of getting a criminal record and because of the experience of getting into prison. <laughs> Chosen a criminal record, you need a song on all of the two, that thing I'm young and was the deal. So, so if I can just, yeah, yeah, uh, you're so the, the U US, my country, has a very particular problem here, and Nora knows that too, and others do. We even have a word for it in the United States, and it's a, it's a shameful word. It's called mass incarceration. There are so many people being put in jails, and we have been waging a so called war on drugs that has failed. And it, what it has done is to create this phenomenon, the statistics. So the United States has a little over 5% of the population of the world, and we have nearly 25% of the people who are jailed across the entire world. So that's, and we have more people in jail than any other nation. And this issue of the racial inequities that you picked up on, Your Holiness, is very serious. So one statistic is that in the United States, blacks represent about 13% of our population, and they represent about 45% of people who are in jail for drug violations. Many of those drug violations are nonviolent. So we tend to think that you go to jail because you're involved in a very violent culture, but many of them that the person who's jailed hasn't done anything violent, but has possessed this drug or maybe sold it. Mm. Um, and the, the studies that have been done um, seem to indicate that the use of drugs by blacks and whites in the US isn't dramatically different. So it's not about they're, they're using them more, it's about a serious inequity, a serious bias that's built into this war on drugs. Our attorney general, recently has been speaking out against it. Um, but the problem we now have, and this is, part, it makes it even worse, it, we have a very big now private for-profit industry that's managing this mass incarceration sy system that we've created for ourselves. <laughs> and says that he has heard of that. Uh, right, yeah. and so how you back, yeah. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, so when he first heard of this, this mm. kind of privatization of the prison system and how it's for profit system, yeah. he said it was construct more prison. So uh, you have to find prisoner. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. 
So it's another, way, it's another example, we've heard several, where money creates terrible mm. problems mm. for society. And, and we have a very serious problem. There are people who've written about it. So, mm. so it's all the thing, it's not the money, it's the, 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 the user, greed. The the user greed. of the money. User, right? user yeah. Of yeah. money. Yeah. Yeah. Some people have even referred to this inequity as mm. American apartheid. <laughs> <laughs> That's the term they use. Miriam Jil, Ari Miriam Jis Lagoris, about that. I would just like to add that even though the system in Europe is different, we still see that uh, around 30 to 60, depending on the country, of the people in prisons are uh, that's related. It's drug offences, and most of them are not. Again, violent offence. It's it's just for possession, for own use, or a little bit more. It's so a lot of the prison populations are actually there due to uh, drugs, but non-violent. Right. And of course, we could be building schools and other things with yeah. the money we're investing. Yeah. yeah. So the other... And the other... So those who are in incarceration, I mean, is there a difference in terms of education status, less education, you're more yes. likely? Yes. Yeah. Yes, there's a, the, the, the racial imbalance and also an imbalance in terms of social mm. status, racial. socioeconomic status. Yeah. It's a huge injustice. Uh, but if the gap rich and poor reduce, uh, some help? Will it help if the, if the kind if of the, the social inequity is reduced oh, a little bit in the society. Yes, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's uh, that the, the it's increasing, as Your Holiness knows, and that, that and that may be part so, of the problem. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure how reducing that would yeah, yeah. solve this particular problem. There so, are efforts. Yes, there, there are there are mandatory sentencing requirements that were built into this war on drugs. So when a so a person a drug user comes before a judge. This is the problem. It comes before the judge. The judge has no choice. The judge is required to sentence this person to go to jail. And that is one of the things that could be changed. And Eric Holder, who is the U.S. Attorney General, has spoken about trying to change that. But again, there is this, now this very large industry that has a very vested interest in keeping this. So, so there are things we can do, but it's a serious problem. Nora, you probably know even more about it. that doesn't always work, uh, the drug courts. And the drug courts have actually right. created um, a, a completely different model with very much of a success. So a person that is taking drugs is brought in front of a judge, and the judge can give them the option to either go to prison or jail or to go to a treatment program. And the outcomes are much, much better when the person chooses, and basically all of them choose to go to the treatment program. The problem, though, is that there are not sufficient, uh, there's not sufficient infrastructure to offer the drug court option right. for a significant number. So perhaps 10% of the individuals get offered the drug court. And if you look at it in terms of ethnicity, it's neither a fair system. So right. not everybody has exactly the same right. 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 Thank you. the illegal drug. So we're talking about illegal substances here, yes. the ones that are yes. criminals. Yeah. Yeah. I would just like to add that some of the... I would just like to add that some of the... So how about um, coming up with a system where, you know, for specific needs of individuals, there could be certain types of drugs which, if the a medical profession... Any drugs, any uh, drugs. Any drugs. Usually it's considered something illegal. illegal. Oh. But, you know, based on a medical profession, the medical doctor's uh, kind of observation and the need of that patient, could be made legal mm -hmm. for that individual. Yes. But otherwise it could be illegal. Is that possible? There, there are movements in that direction. Yeah. Again, Nora will know m more about it, uh, yeah. calling it medical marijuana, yeah. making it available. Yeah. 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 
And in that case, if if you do need to imprison uh, prison, imprison someone, then you can imprison the doctor who prescribed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 In India, this is what you say. England. 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 Yeah. Heroin. The doctor get on them. Prescription change. So do it. So try it. The others. They are related. The marijuana. The doctor get better. So can chip. Nasu. If I could just add, so marijuana so medical use is to, to for pain relief. Is that the idea? Yeah. 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 Mm. And um, they are using it for Meek, not glaucoma. Yeah. Cancer. Yeah. 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 So is that uh, the case in the states or no? In certain states. In certain states. 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 Yeah. Oh. Right. It goes. Yeah. yeah. We have the jurisdiction state by state in the U.S. Mm. So different states have different policies. Mm. So. Mm. And two states, yes. Um, mm. Was commenting. Two states is uh, really available. It's, it's legal for recreation purposes, and in the other one is mm. for. So called medical purposes. So there are two states where it's freely yes. available for yes, recreation. Colorado and Washington. Because mm. it's mm. Now, then the okay. Colorado and Washington nearly are yeah, under the theory. The mm. Nazo Yumela Matuva Super Junior Chicho Freely available. So, mm. so this mm. is just marijuana, though. Yes. Yeah. Cannabis. Yeah. 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 Isn't that a kind of an extreme? In my view, it is. Uh, but, but these are, again, uh, what, what, what is called, I mean, the discussion right now of how important the social systems are and the perception in some states through culture that marijuana is not harmful and therefore it should be readily available. Just like at the beginning of the last century, it was felt that cocaine was not harmful and it had a lot of medicinal purposes and it was legal until the consequences were too negative, too devastating, and it was made illegal in 1914. But in, in the Netherlands, where I live, uh, it's completely legal. Pot, hash, all cannabis products are completely legal, and so are some psychedelic mushrooms. And you know what the result is? Nothing. People, are <laughs> people drink. That's the result. <laughs> they drink beer. <laughs> so that's in, in, what do you mean results are nothing? I There's mean to no say difference. that legalizing the has, use not, has, not, increased. has yeah. not increased the problem at all. Mm. The only people who, people who smoke pot uh, and hash are usually American tourists. <laughs> 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 so it has, it has improved tourism. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would just like to add uh, to Nora's comment. No, <laughs> So the His Holiness's question is the following. Given that there are two states, Washington and Colorado, where marijuana I mean, two is categories. Now, one yeah. category, allow. One yeah. category, illegal. So, um, the kind of... Chowa, the much over. And the kind of state kaga. State kaga, the much over. Kaga, the much over. So, how do you do? Membe, kaga, the membe, the membe, the membe, the membe, the membe. So his only question is this, in the states, in one country, you have states like Colorado and Seattle, which makes marijuana, no, Washington, uh, Washington, Washington yeah. uh, legal, and then other states which makes it not legal. Mm -hmm. So who makes the decision? Who determines it? Is it the electorate. A, a medical body? No, it's, or it's voted. policy? It's policy. Uh, Politics. Oh. <laughs> Sure. Right. Sure. They have a referendum. The majority. Right. Mm. right. Okay. Yeah. 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 People decided. We see the same thing in Europe. That different uh, countries in Europe have different policies on on uh, marijuana. That in some countries it's uh, it is illegal to uh, sorry sorry it's legal to use it and to possess it for own uh, for own use, but not for mm. dealing uh, with it. 
Yeah, no, the point that I was going to say when it says, well, it's the majority, the problem is that there are invested interests that are putting right. enormous amount of money right. in order to make the perception of people that marijuana is not harmful because there is a lot of money to be made. Right. And what you've already started to see in places like Colorado is a gigantic industry for the production of cannabinoids. And once you create these uh, individuals that have a, an economic interest in the mm. product, it's very difficult to change it, mm. like with alcohol. It's an ex perfect example of mm. the lobbies for alcohol, the lobbies for tobacco, very difficult then to go backwards. Right. But we should, we should allow <laughs> yeah. Vivica to continue. <laughs> yes. Um, should I make comments to, or just leave the comments on this discussion? Yeah, I'll, I'll move Keep on. Going. Yeah. Um, so a second uh, example I would like to um, put forward to His Holiness, Your Holiness, is that sometimes criminal policy is, um, or social policy and criminal policy are interwoven with each other. Um, and this creates a social imbalance. Um, and th th here again, the US is an example that if you're convicted for a drug offense, you are banned from access uh, to public housing for low-income persons, unable to get financial assistance to low-income families, food assistance and or education funding. Um, and, and this sort of gives uh, drug offenders from low, low socioeconomic groups um, a disadvantage. They are sort of double punished. They get convicted, but they also get ineligible for social benefits. People from high uh, uh, socioeconomic income groups, they are not eligible for social benefits anyway, so they won't have this double um, punishment. So there's, there's some <laughs> dilemmas and some harms <laughs> involved <laughs> in these <laughs> policies. <laughs> And the last example I would like to put forward is that um, criminal policy seems in very many places to overrule public health policy because uh, it's not only the substances that causes harm to individuals, but uh, depending on the substance use, for example, opiates, uh, the, the way that uh, heroin is um, used can also cause harm. Um, and, and therefore there are uh, movements and public health policies such as harm reduction that sort of look, on, look at well, we have drug users who use drugs, and this is harmful in itself, but the way they're used and, and where they're used can also be uh, quite harmful. And one thing is that, that we have seen, um, uh, it started in the 80s and early 90s, that there's been a, an epidemic of HIV AIDS and hepatitis C among drug users because they have been sharing uh, equipment or syringes. So could we set up services where uh, needle and syringe exchange are possible uh, so that, that that kind of harm is not uh, um, put upon uh, drug users? Another and there are such programs. There are yeah. such, such programs in, in some places, but mm -hmm. not right. in all not, places. Not widespread, yeah. No. Another uh, debated uh, uh, service is drug consumption rooms, uh, where uh, drug users are, have the possibility to take their drugs under supervised um, uh, conditions. And th these drug consumption rooms are set up to prevent overdose and health damage to drug users, but also to, to sort of uh, uh, see to that the nuisance for the public that drug users can create in neighborhoods are placed within these drug consumption rooms instead of uh, in the streets. Uh, but, but these kinds of uh, measures are also uh, highly debated because does these actually condone illegal uh, behavior? Um, and can we accept that we set up services where we also um, uh, sort of accept that drug 
drugs are taken and drugs are used, even though it's a, it's a, it's a criminalized uh, action or behavior. And the last uh, example of one of these harm reduction measures is to set up uh, treatment uh, facilities where abstinence is not required, but where you can sort of, if it's uh, a, a treatment program where substitution drugs is involved, uh, where you can get your substi substitution drug, not for just a certain period of time, but for as long as uh, you need it. Um, and this leads me to uh, the conclusion of this uh, sort of so social science perspective into addiction and problematic drug use, that it is always uh, experienced by individuals who are embedded in social and cultural relations and social cult and cultural con settings or contexts, and that not only the substances used, but also the way societies control and regulate substances can cause harm uh, to individuals as well as communities. Thank you. Thank you. So we, before we invite in other voices, I wonder if you have a question that you'd like to pose to His Holiness. Yes. Um, Diana started out um, saying something about also that these drugs are, especially legal drugs, are also uh, very stigmatized uh, in our societies. And drug users who use these illegal drugs become uh, stigmatized and can be marginalized in our societies. So. Um, my question to your holiness is, how can we sort of assure that, that we as communities and as societies do not stigmatize these people? And, uh, and if we have stigmatized them... And if we have stigmatized them, how can we sort of uh, reverse that so, so that they can be included into our... Uh, social re relations mm. and societies, because it seems like social networks and societies and belonging to these contexts are very important. I think basically, you see, they, these people also say, human being, human being, right? I would like to ask, uh, so for example, if we marginalize them, if we don't accept them as part of the mainstream society. But if one of these individuals are killed by someone, will we consider that, that a murder? Yes. 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 Oh, so they con yeah. still consider yeah. human beings. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but how much effort do we put into figuring out who did murder this person? <laughs> Mm. And also, I think the reality, even you see the criminal person, you see, under different circumstances, or mainly, I think, increased awareness, then one a very negative person due to different circumstances, can be a very positive person. Mm -hmm. So it is much better mm -hmm. uh, give them opportunity. Yes. So in order to do that, bring them part of the society. Right. If reject, then this person, again now, hopeless, sadly, has the chicken. Then they go through the cycle. Then they go through, the cycle. They go through the cycle of giving up hope, and they may also become defiant. You know, they just yes. don't care. Right. Right. I think in the, in the, in the past, uh, some some discussions, some people, the prison listen in Shivaji, the 
his Holiness was saying that he had um, been exposed to concerns in some context in the con conversations um, and conferences in, in the West, concerns on the part of some non-profit uh, non organizations about the way in which the prisoners are treated mm -hmm. when they're in incarceration and how the prison authorities, you know, kind of the uh, negative ways in which they are perceived and so on, uh, which seems to really uh, suggest a kind of a, a sense of rejection and not accepting them as part of the mainstream society. Okay. And in this context, um, the experience of um, one of the chief prison authorities in Delhi, the Tihar jail, um, I think it's uh, Kiran Bedi, right? No, oh, yes, yes. Kiran, Kiran Bedi um, shared with his holiness that while she was running that prison as the main person, she was able to introduce other programs such as bringing in meditation and other forms of intervention, which has really changed the life of these prisons uh, and, and really made a dramatic difference to the prisoners. So that's a very right. positive... So that, that yeah. clearly shows right. if you take care of right. them, right. it's a human being. Yeah. You see, they, because of that, they develop some kind of sense of responsibility. responsibility. Uh -huh. right. If you reject... Okay. Right. And I was... Uh, one time I met one uh, so, so in Italy, uh, someone so I met, you see, he or that person, you see, go, usually, you see, uh, go to uh, prison and give some teaching or some sort of, kind of that, talks. No. Uh, talks. So there are such cases, I think. Yeah. Yes. Is it? So it's really important to find a way of making them feel that they are not rejected. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Good. So. So, thank you, thank you, Your Holiness. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think it was yesterday, Your Holiness, um, when we were talking about how to make sure that people who are in these terrible problems are not pushed to the sides. You said, we have in the Christian tradition the belief that there is that of God in every yes. person, and the Buddhist tradition, the, the, the Buddha nature. The Buddha nature. Oh. Um, and one of the questions is, uh, so what do we have in a s secular society that can substitute for ha that? We have a, a wonderful scholar with us, Wendy Farley, ha who has made uh, of her career the study of early Christian mystics, mostly women. She is one of the great, great experts on that subject. And I wondered, Wendy, if I could bring you in, you're furrowing your brow. <laughs> great, the word great. Great is the wrong word. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so is there anything you can add to kind of help us see this in, in another perspective? How did, how did they think about this struggle? Um, the, one of the things I love about the desert ascetics and the women contemplatives is that they practice non-judgment very assiduously. Um, they were famous for drawing in people from society that were um, rejected by everyone else. Murderer, they would hide murderers because they were opposed to the death penalty and they would raise um, children that had been abandoned. They bought girls who were going to be sold into slavery. Um, so they were very active in caring for mm -hmm. the dregs of society, people who no, no one else would recognize. And it was precisely because they thought every single person, they would say, are God-bearers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that their training was to recognize in everyone, that they are God-bearers. Mm -hmm. And by recognizing it, could it inflame it in them. Um, hmm. So that, that's, um, I suppose that would be, if you translate that into the contemporary situation, that 
the contemplative practice is to give you eyes to see something that is mm. harder to see without that. To see someone who's a bad drug addict or if you're a racist, to see a black kid, you know, smoking a joint or whatever, and you, and you are very condemning. A contemplative wants to make you able to see, and what you see is that this is a beautiful, luminous being, mm -hmm. and to respond to them in that way. And that's what the practices are for. Uh, so I, I know that um, Sarah has been anxious to get in on this because she's very much involved in treatment, which yes. is so important to Yupika's conversation. So I don't want to say more right now because we don't have much time. All right, let's, let's go to Sarah. Can you, so tell us about, uh, what, you're, you're speaking on Friday morning, but, but, but some sense of, as you respond to Vivica's presentation, what your research has suggested about, perhaps about this process of self treatment, self-cure, or, or, or anything that kind of came to you as you were listening? Um, well, actually, what I was just responding to here and listening to, to Wendy and, and Vivica is the, um, uh, the role of shame. Um, uh. And, you know, what, what we do know is that any kind of uh, negative affective experience, whether it's shame, depression, anxiety, uh, is not helpful for folks trying to make positive changes in their lives. And um, so both, I think, shame and judgment directed towards self or felt from society is, is not going to be helpful in this process if we're wanting to make change. From a, a treatment perspective and um, drawing on the contemplative practices, uh, there are some beautiful ways to work with that. Um, could, you, could you say a bit about sure, how you I do think that? Both from a, um, directed towards self and directed outwards, there are practices that explicitly help to foster non-judgmental attitudes to first of all recognize our judgments and our biases towards ourselves and others and then to practice very specifically uh, ways to relate to our own experience um, without judgment and with some compassion in a way that actually facilitates change much more than the harshness and the judgment would even though that's where we tend to go um, so practicing kindness practicing compassion practicing um, just this, this, having this awareness and recognition that these are human processes. And as we saw from Nora's presentation and Ken's presentation and from you, Vivica, that this, um, all of these are pointing to, this is clearly part of human nature. Right. Uh, it's so prevalent and it has, um, you know, neuropsychological causes, it has societal causes. Um, so it only makes sense to meet that with uh, understanding and compassion and look at what actually facilitates change, mm -hmm. which um, is, is not judgment and shame, but rather um, some compassion and, and kindness. So that would be another element to add to the list that Vibeka had of the, the, the variables that help to produce successful outcomes in treatment, yeah. this issue of shame really bringing it to the surface, dealing Absolutely, with it. and it's so prevalent, I think, I mean, in all of us, obviously, but in working with clients, I see just so much self-hatred and shame and a sense of, you know, um, just a, a total devaluing of themselves and to begin to recognize that and work on practices of sending kindness towards self uh, and compassion towards self and recognizing the really beautiful intentions and efforts that people are making in this process of change. Great. Thank you. Arthur. It's a question to you, Vibhika, and, and maybe others. Um, use by of many of these substances at least by indigenous peoples in other words there are social and cultural contexts in which these are totally integrated into their whole society is there something we can learn from that <laughs> Yes, I think uh, there is. Like, um, I mean, coca leaves have been chewed, 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 yeah. chewed right. <laughs> in uh, in South America for for many centuries, and uh, and opium have been used in 
in in the triangle of Burma, Laos, and China, and and that part of the world, and uh, and it has been in the same way as we sort of consume alcohol. Marana has been used in this part of the world very much. Um, India, Nepal, this the p particular part we we are in right now, and and. And these substances are consumed in the same way as we can consume um, uh, alcohol or consume alcohol in the West as the most widespread substance used uh, at all in the West. Uh, and, and, and looking more into to, to how, how these practices of use of these different kinds of substances are interrelated into everyday life, maybe not everyday life, but at least um feasts and uh and and celebrations and so on um yeah i think we can learn something from that so before we close at lunch we were having a conversation about all of this having just heard from nora and she pointed out something i hadn't known which is there is now a subfield of neuroscience called social neuroscience so kind of combining this social science perspective with this deep sort of basic science perspective. I wonder if you could just tell us a little word about what it is that social neuroscientists think about and do. Yes, and I'm, again, I'm not going to resist the temptation to, to where my brain jumps back and forth, and I'll come to that question. Fine, you make... Right. But the, where is The, the other thing that we can learn, because I think we have to also look at the data and be objective from the use of legal substances in large civilizations for many, many centuries, the, in the United States, the main cause of mortality and morbidity by far, by far, are not illicit substances, are alcohol and tobacco, tobacco. the yes. legal ones. Mm. Not because they are more dangerous, not at all, mm -hmm. but right. because they are widely available, the norms accept them as safe, and as a result of for that, more people get exposed to them, right. and therefore, by probability, mathematical, mathematically, you can look at it, simple, more people get exposed, mm -hmm. more adverse effects. So I think that we cannot forget that as we go into these discussions of legalization and I also think we have to make the clear-cut distinction that you can decriminalize a drug without legalizing it. So you don't need to put a person that's taking marijuana into the, into the jail, right. but you do not want to create mm -hmm. an incentive for a market to produce more marijuana mm -hmm. because right. you have more people exposed. So that, that was, mm -hmm. I yes. apologize, I could not no, resist. That's, no. no, that's but, good, and I did present that yeah. data. Yeah. But I, th I yeah. think we need to, right. to add to that that the whole illegal substance market is actually also very... Uh, large, and it also creates a lot of harm that we have illegal markets. Um, right. Yeah, no, no, and, and yeah. we can't go into... Yeah. Wait, 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 it's just that. Wait, 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 wait. That's <laughs> right. That's <laughs> Yeah, and I'm, but, uh, but it's, it's, so that's a kind of a middle way. Uh, I think a middle that's, way. That, yes. That's, that's yeah. kind of a middle yes. way. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. right. Decriminalize, but yeah. not make it legal. Yes, that's yes. Right. The, yes. Your question about the social neuroscience, which is another aspect that has been fascinating, which is uh, starting to understand what structures in our brain are responsible for processing social behaviors and social emotions. And imaging technologies like the one we were discussing have been actually utilized to start to map the networks that are activated in those behaviors or situations. For example, if you are to make a moral judgment, how does the brain work? And how is it influenced, that function of the brain, by your prior culture or unique circumstances? And for example, a very interesting study that, um, yeah, again, captures what you were saying, Viraco, mm -hmm. of the making harm, is that when you put someone in prison, it's extraordinarily stressful. It's probably one of the most degrading things that you can do an individual. And the worst thing can, you can do in a prison 
is isolate them. So that's the worst punishment. You can do experiments like that in animals. And if you isolate an animal, what you do is that D2 receptors, which we're discussing, goes down. So by putting individuals that are addicted to drugs into a prison system, you're actually worsening their likelihood of succeeding and reintegrating. So that's another ex example about how we can use imaging to understand social structures that we generate in order to punish people. Thank you. So. Matthew, please. You said this is exactly what uh, Control Bhutan did. It's n you can't buy any kawatu anywhere, but you are not punished if you bring some from India and smoke. So it is very, very little. There's just, just no way to buy anywhere. And it's succeed throughout the country. So it's a quite good success because very, very few people smoke. So. Yes. Julia. Ah. What is this? I heard that. Uh. Better not, because they grow it from there in the garden. Oh, oh. His Holiness is saying that they do have another, another substitute, which is the beetle nuts. Ah, yes. <laughs> so the, yeah. now, so, now so, the, so the, the, the teeth become yellow or, you know, mm -hmm. right, yeah. red. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we have reached our time boundary, Your Holiness. I want to thank you. Vivica, for your very interesting presentation. We've had a, an extremely full day, I think, across a wide spectrum of concerns, starting all the way deep in the brain and moving out into the larger society. So we thank everyone for a fascinating day. And Your Holiness, thanks to you. Uh, by individuals to use uh, uh, substances. And the substance is very good. Yes, it 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 is very good. The substance would cover alcohol, drugs, and yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have put in a slide because I wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of science uh, that I'm doing, which is a bit different from what we have heard uh, the past two days, three days. Um, and I would like to start out saying that this presentation is not only based on qualitative research, as I will um, present in more depth to Your Holiness in a minute, uh, but also on qualitative research using statistics. Quantitative sorry, quantitative research using statistics and uh, survey results. Um, but my own main field, trained as an anthropologist, is within uh, qualitative research. And the way this kind of science operate is uh, through different methods. And some of them can, for example, be qualitative interviews, where you, um, the researcher, engage with another person and ask questions and and, and gather data in that way, using focus group interviews where several people are engaged uh, and the researcher uh, go into conversation with these uh, several individuals. It can be part participant observation where the researcher uh, become, becomes part of a certain setting or a certain context for a certain amount of time and sort of try to live with uh, the people who are in this context. And, um, <laughs> and this, this particular uh, method is important in order to, so to try to gain um, information that is not uh, conscious or spoken about, outspoken, but more tacit knowledge around why is it that we are doing uh, and how is it, or why is it, and, and the ways that we are doing things. So, and then there's text and documents also. Um, I would also like to say that, that this kind of research is, is not linear, it's more circular. So if you have an interview uh, guide, for example, for the qualitative interviews, 
um, and you have interviewed three or four or five people, and you, um, you, you realize that one of the most important things that you would like to know something about, you did not put in your interview schedule. You immediately put it in, and the next, people you in, the next person you interview, you ask those questions also. So it differs, for example, from survey research, where you have the questionnaire. You would never change that, because then you sort of spoil the whole, the whole uh, study. So, so it's a reflexive, circular process. Um, this kind of research. Um, of course, the analysis is made more in the end. Yeah. Of course, the analysis is done more at the end of a research pro project than in the beginning, but the, the analysis is part of the whole project. And what, what comes out is, uh, or what we look at is... ...failed with flaws as people who should be treated as deviants, should be separated from society, should be punished criminally. Now, those stereotypes that she is working against in her post in Washington uh, do persist. They have not gone away. Um, and those stereotypes are produced through social processes. Uh, they create them, they sustain them. Uh, so part of what we want to do this afternoon is to begin to explore some of those larger mm -hmm. social processes. But first I wanted to just say that I think we've noted a number of fascinating parallels in these past two and a half days between the emerging scientific understanding of craving, desire, and addiction and the Buddhist scholarship, or as your Holiness said, as you were lightly correcting your <laughs> jimpa, thumtum <laughs> jimpala, uh, with a great smile, not just Buddhist, but ancient Indian philosophy and psychology. Um, we've seen really interesting parallels, and I think there's something both very reassuring in those parallels, and also something humbling in them. Reassuring to know that a wisdom tradition extending back some 2,000 years of systematic first-person study of the human mind has reached conclusions that support the findings that are now coming out of the very different and relatively very new third-person investigations of modern science. That's reassuring. Humbling to be reminded that our whiz-bang technology is in part simply confirming things that were already known. But of course, that's only part of the story because they are also pointing us in new directions. And it's the combination that's powerful of the two perspectives. And almost as Keith was explaining to us yesterday, it takes the combination of the activated brain, activated by dopamine, and the cue to create the result. And I think the combination of these two traditions, when they come together, can create a powerful result in a similar way. And I was re reminded this morning as I was thinking about that of the words from T.S. Eliot uh, about exploration where he wrote, we shall not cease from explorations and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. So I think in part we're seeing a process <laughs> like that. <laughs> Also, I was struck during our conversations yesterday afternoon that another of the deep resonances, deep concordances between these two great intellectual traditions, both of which in many ways are pursuing how do we know reality? How do we find reality and know it when we see it. A similarity is that they pursue that question, both of these traditions, in the context of a community, a very powerful, strong, intentional community, a community, community that's rooted in very deep values. And for science, it's the community of peer review and of the requirement that results have to be reproducible. We, yesterday, Kent's 
charming, I think, and just disarming humility. He kept saying, I may be wrong, and we heard the same words from Nora this morning. Those statements are not only because these are wonderful and deeply honest people with great integrity, they're also expressions of a deep value of Western science. The dictum from Albert Einstein. Thank you, Your Holiness. Thank you. Welcome back. We had an amazing morning. I think we all agree. It might have been a whole graduate course in the chemistry of the brain and neuroscience. I have to confess that there were points at which I felt that my head was hurting <laughs> as I was taking in all of this amazing information. But I could also hear and sense in the room throughout the room, these moments of, aha, that's how it works. I think we all really are just so deeply grateful to you, Nora, for that wonderful, wonderful presentation. And your holiness to you, too. Yes? May I add one thing? You certainly may, always. <laughs> I think from, from childhood, I always see look from the negative side, negative side away. If someone, if she tells something, then I always look. From the contrary side. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. That also, we train that way. So, so one way, I really appreciate all the specialists. Really, you are expert. Uh, but your own field is really expert. I really very much appreciate. But these things are, from the Buddhist viewpoint, relative. It connected mm. many other things. So, in order to become a very realistic specialist, you should look wider away. Uh, uh. <laughs> Sometimes, like, like this, is a great scientist. Look only. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's the exception. He's the exception. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's the exception. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Your Holiness, thank you, because that's the perfect introduction <laughs> to the afternoon, because we hope to widen the lens oh. and, and look more widely at some of these questions. The other thing, though, that I wanted to comment on this morning, I thanked our presenter, but I also want to thank you, because watching you take in this information, this flood of information, and then with your questions, always anticipating the next slide, the next mm -hmm. step in the logical sequence that the scientist is pursuing in her research is just extraordinary. And also the intellectual stamina that Your Holiness brings to these interactions is a wonderful demonstration of the value of getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning and meditating <laughs> every day. So we learn from watching Your Holiness. Thank you. So it's wonderful to have Nora Volkow and her powerful voice as another of the neuroscientists on this impressive neuroscience team we've been hearing from all week. Uh, and then also as our only physician, and I did want to mention that among our presenters, uh, Nora is our only physician, and she's committed to this hopeful view. I'm not going to say it. Right. Committed to this hopeful view that, as she often says, and I think said on her first slide, Drug, ab drug addiction is a chronic brain disease that can be treated, and every word in that sentence carries freight for her, because it's a declaration of progress. It's uh, the triumph of modern science over myths and misconceptions that have, uh, uh, that have been with us for many, many years, that painted addicts as lacking in willpower, as morally uh, Einstein, that no experiment can ever prove me right, and a single experiment can always prove me wrong. Your Holiness's playful and affectionate comments putting Jimpa on notice that the monks were poised to pounce when he started his presentation, and then pointing out that he had a mistake on one of his slides. <laughs> he had misspelled a word was also an demonstrating an essential value of a community, a sangha, 
committed to rationality, to empiricism, to skepticism, to pragmatism. So, and you too often express your willingness to be persuaded if someone can bring you evidence that might prove you wrong. So we have that combination of communities that see the world in that same way in, that I've described. And we are deeply embedded here in these two powerful communities. And communities are social and cultural constructions. They're the work of societies. A so, uh, an American sociologist, Robert Bella, wrote a book once called The Good Society. And the opening sentence of that book was, it's difficult to be a good person in the absence of a good community and a good society. And I think we all mm -hmm. agree that that is true. So yesterday, also, Your Holiness, when you were offering Ken a perspective on his puzzle, he called it a puzzle about how fear and desire could possibly be linked in the same brain system, you said, we're all social animals, and when we become isolated or feel alone, that creates fear. And I think all of us in the room recognize the truth in that comment. You and Nora made similar comments to each other this morning. So we turn now, this afternoon, to these social and cultural considerations. And to guide us, we have a wonderful anthropologist, Vibeka Asmussen Frank. She's an anthropologist, as I say, who directs a center for alcohol and drug research at Aarhus University in Denmark. She's been there mm. for 12 years. Her own work has been mainly studying marijuana. Uh, cannabis, as it's called, but also alcohol and alcohol abuse and other drugs. She studied policies and treatments in community settings and in prisons, with a special focus always. She's always interested in understanding the perspectives of the people who are using the drugs. What is it meaning to them? What are their lives like? <coughs> Over many years, it's been the case that Scandinavian scholars, scholars from the Nordic countries, have made major contributions to alcohol and drug research. They're well known for that. And also to approaches using qualitative methods to try to understand, dig down underneath the underlying meanings of social phenomena. And that's the tradition from which Vibeka comes to us today. So she will be raising questions She'll be challenging assumptions, and she'll be hoping, hoping that by doing this, she'll, and by opening these additional layers of complexity, as if the problem isn't complex enough already, that that will spark reflection and discussion uh, among the group at another level. In her work, she's most interested in asking, what can we learn when we turn our minds in new directions and ask and try to see new perspectives, new questions that we may not have thought about before. So with that, Vibeka, turn Thank it you. over to you. Thank you, Diana. Yeah. Um, it's, it is working, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <coughs> first of all, I would like to express my um, gratitude. It's a deep honor and a privilege to be here today and to share uh, some of my thoughts uh, with your holi holiness. Um, and as Diana said, uh, my main interest is in uh, how, are, how are individuals, how are people living uh, with substances. And substances has been around the world for many thousands of years, since the beginning of mankind. And, uh, and substances can be used in very many different ways. It can be, we can consume them. We can use them in, um, in pleasurable uh, settings for parties and feasts and things like that. And they can become very problematic, as we have heard about uh, the last uh, few days. Um, and um, so some of my interest is also to, to looking at when and how and with whom are these substances uh, used. Um, and a very important point of departure for most of what I'm doing is that using drugs, whether it's legal or illegal drugs, is always social practices. 
you do it with other people. <laughs> At least you start out doing it with other people, and it's, it's in certain contexts that drugs are used. Um, so I would like to go to the slides and, and, um, and start out uh, saying that, um, sort of trying to, to, to put my perspective in what we have been learning the past uh, few days and also this morning, that, um, that all the valuable knowledge that we get from studying the brain and, uh, and from your neuroscience perspectives, um, I sort of move this brain into a person, but <laughs> and and we have also heard um, pers personal or the perspectives seen from the individual from Jin Pala. Yeah, yeah, also. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's good because immediately you know it's a human brain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not mice. Not <laughs> mice. <laughs> or mosquitoes. Yeah. <laughs> and not only that, I would like to place individuals in relation to other individuals uh, and, and to show that individuals are always placed in, in, in context and in social relations and that these contexts are also larger commun communities and uh, societies as such. And, and that, that these social relations and the whole society affects and shape also the way we uh, look at uh, addiction or, or problematic drug use. So the overall perspective uh, that uh, I will uh, take today is to look at uh, relations between individuals, uh, but also the dynamics between individuals uh, and the socio-cultural contexts. Um, I will look at processes in and out of substance use, problematic substance use or addiction, uh, and but I will always do this from the perspective of that it's relations between individuals that are uh, important here in this perspective. Um, and then uh, I will take the perspective, as Diana pointed out, of, uh, of the drug user or the substance user. How is it experienced 